Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. Uh, you can see my face now. Wow, look at that. Uh, and I'm Professor Ren. I'm your host. Disclaimer, I'm not a professor at any university or I don't even have a doctorate. Uh, simply if I were to present this material to you uh, in a class format, I'd probably be in a college because you, there's nowhere else, you know, take Byzantine history really anywhere else. Uh, it's really only available at the college level. And so if I presented this material to you, uh, you would call me a professor and that's really it. That's all I got. Uh, if you have found us, if you found this video on YouTube, please give the channel a subscribe, uh, like the video, the thumbs up. Very nice. Um, and uh, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you never miss uh, an episode. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, please give us a follow there as well as a five-star review. Apparently five-star reviews really help. So even if you, even if you just listen on, on YouTube, for example, if you primarily listen, go, if you have an iPhone, go find this on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and give it a five-star review anyway. Even, even if you're not, even if you don't use it at all. Just helps out. It's work it helps. Um, we also have an Instagram account. You can find the Instagram account. It is academics underscore ninety five, and that's spelled A C A D E M I X underscore nine five. Where I post updates about the show and memes. We actually just posted a meme that I kind of um, found somewhere else online, but I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, it's got it's got almost four hundred likes at this point, so that's pretty good. But there's no increase in views on the episode, guys. Come on, get over to the channel and we're not just here for the memes, okay? Some things you can be here, just you can just be here for the memes, but not for this. Uh, and so what I wanted to do today, this is gonna be a shorter video format. So as, I, as I've started making this, you know, you kind of realize that there are some topics that maybe you wanted to hit on that you just, you didn't get around to or there wasn't time for in the main episodes. So what I wanna do is kind of throughout the week, maybe, two to three times a week, maybe it'll only be once a week. Uh, we'll do a shorter episode on a very specific topic that I wanted to uh, talk about that we didn't necessarily get to in the main episode. And uh, that, well, this is, this is our first one. And so I wanted to touch on the Nestorian heresy and the Council of Ephesus uh, of 431 because we, were, we have been talking about the fourth century and uh, we're in the middle of that and we just didn't, we haven't gotten to it. Um, so I wanna to talk, to, to, to talk about it now. I've got enough of my notes in front of me here. So excuse me as I look down from time to time. Uh, so what exactly was Nestorianism? Well, it was started by a guy named Nestorius. Now Nestorius was uh, the Bishop of Constantinople uh, during the fifth century. Uh, although he was from Syria, he was born and pro probably raised in Syria, uh, but he makes his way up to be the Bishop of Constantinople, which is, which is pretty important. And Nestorius questioned uh, a certain phraseology in the uh, liturgy. And actually, I want to, before I get started with that as well, let's get going. Because now I can do visuals. I almost forgot to start using the visuals. Okay, so here we have Nestorius. And uh, again, he is the, uh, let me just make sure this is the right, yeah. For a second, I, I put together two different uh, slides for tonight. All right that I put up, put together tonight. <laughs> I just want to make sure I was on the right one. But anyway, this, this is a, this is an image of Nestorius, again, Bishop of Constantinople. And he is questioning a certain phraseology in the liturgy, which is the Theotokos. Now, Theotokos is the Greek word for, uh, it means God bearer. This is used in the, uh, in the Eastern Rite liturgies and uh, Eastern Orthodox liturgies to refer to uh, Mary, the mother of God. So because she, she bore uh, Jesus Christ. And so because of that, uh, she is the Theotoko, she is the God bearer, right? But Nestorius, uh, first of all, he, his line of thinking kind of goes like this. So he questions, okay, 
So our, if we are to believe that Jesus is God, then his mother would have had to be a goddess. And because we do not believe that Mary was a goddess, therefore Jesus cannot be a god. Um, almost, almost like this uh, uh, Greek mythology uh, uh, thinking here, right? Hercules was half god and half man, so therefore he's a demigod. So if Jesus, not having an earthly father, um, has a human mother, therefore Jesus was born human and not divine. So Nestorius comes to the conclusion that because he, 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 pr he proposes uh, using the new terminology for Mary instead of Theotokos, God bearer, he wants to use the phrase uh, Christotokos, meaning Christ bearer, which essentially is the same, well, I, actually, it's the way he's using it, it's not the same because he's using it to indicate that Jesus was born only human, not divine, okay? So essentially what you have here as, as the image um, uh, uh, depicts, uh, Jesus has a human nature and then he also has a divine nature, but they're not united into one, right? Now, the, the Orthodox, and when I say Orthodox, again, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox, I mean like the mainstream, uh, this is what the church teaches about this, is that uh, Jesus was born 100% human and 100% divine uh, from the moment of conception. There was not a time, when, you know, he wasn't born a human and then became God later, right? Which is essentially the conclusion that, that Nestorius comes, through, comes to. He, he seems to think that Jesus becomes divine later on in life, and it probably happens around the time of the wedding of Cana, because that was uh, when Jesus worked his first miracle. And so it's, I guess Nestorius thought it, it's safe to assume at that point that Jesus is divine then, but he wasn't beforehand. Nestorius also asked the question, how uh, does Jesus suffer and die if he's God, right? If you're, if you're you know, divine, you know, do, do the Greek gods uh, suffer and experience pain? And they certainly don't die because they're immortal, right? But this also, you know, Jesus has to suffer and die and conquer sin and death in order for us to uh, get back to heaven. Uh, I was watching a lecture about this by a priest a while, uh, a couple of days ago. He did a really nice uh, kind of display of this, kind of a drawing it out, right? God sends love down to the world and then we send love back up to God. But because of sin and death, there's a chasm between the love we send up and, and God and Jesus has to come to bridge the gap uh, between us so that our love can get back up to God. And this, the way we do that is through the grace which Jesus brings to us. Really nice, uh, uh, it's a lecture done by a, a priest of the fraternity of St. Peter, if you're interested. Uh, but so Nestorianism uh, becomes popular, especially in Syria. Uh, and again, because Nestorius was from Syri uh, Syria. And here we, this is an image of the Theotokos, right? Again, Theotokos meaning the God bearer. And uh, this is personally, and this is my favorite title for Mary, Mary has a number of titles, you know, the endure of knots, uh, various other ones. But the one I like, the one I like is the Theotokos. Maybe it's because I'm a bit of an Orientophile. Um, but so, for every heresy, we have to have a primary opponent, right? So we talked uh, before about how uh, St. Athanasius is the primary opponent of Arianism, and the primary opponent of Nestorianism was a guy named St. Cyril of Alexandria. And he was, he was the Bishop of Alexandria as well. So we see here as well, uh, Athanasius also from Alexandria, Cyril also from Alexandria. Uh, is there something about Alexandria and being anti-heretic? I don't know. But so what happened is that in, uh, Cyril is going to become the primary opponent of Arianism, and then this is going to uh, bring up a church council in order to deal with Arianism. This is uh, partly, uh, uh, even the emperor Theodosius II is involved in trying to get this going because again, 
heresies are always going to breed conflict and conflict, internal conflict, it's not good for emperors, especially right during, during the fifth century, they've got Goths running through the, the empire, they've got Vandals running through the empire, Huns running through the empire, Franks, uh, uh, Saxons, all, all these different groups and the empire does not, you know, it's like one less problem, please. If we can, if we can solve this with a church council and there's no, there's no war that happens, great, we're, we're, in, we're in good shape. And so the Council of Ephesus is called in order to deal with the Arian heresy. The council rules that Jesus was totally divine and totally human from the moment of conception. So the, again, the Council of Ephesus condemns Nestorianism as a heresy. Now, Nestorianism, uh, though it is, oops, though Nestorianism is ruled a heresy uh, by the church, it's not going to die off automatically. Uh, seemingly, the church really ha has most of its jurisdiction within the Roman Empire because uh, Nestorianism starts to become popular in Persia. I think that's my last slide. Uh, that's, and here we have a painting of the Council of Ephesus. But Nestorianism will move on to um, throughout Asia into Persia, and it makes it as far as, far as Tibet and China. Well, actually, when I was re researching for this, I found, and I guess I could have put it in the slide here, uh, but there's a painting of a priest from, I think it was Palm Sunday uh, in China, an historian priest in China uh, celebrating mass, and there's a painting of it. Um, so that's pretty interesting that although, although it's ruled a heresy, again, you know, how, how far the, the, the church's jurisdiction at this point or how, how well they can enforce what is ruled heresy seems to be limited basically to within the Roman Empire. Again, the Arians as well, you're going to have uh, the, the Visigoths and the Vandals are both uh, Arian Christians. Both, both those groups are Arian Christians. So you can see that the uh, outside of the Roman Empire, although something might be ruled a heresy, it's not necessarily going to get uh, the same crackdown that it gets within the empire. But I believe that is our last, yes it is. And so that is, that is our brief little discussion here on Arianism. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, so if you've made it this far in the video, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, hit the notification bell so you never miss another video. Uh, although this is a video, it will be uploaded to our podcast uh, feed. So if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Play, again, please be sure to give us a follow and a five-star review there. But even though this is being done in video format, it will be uploaded as an audio podcast, but if you want to see the video, you have to watch on YouTube. Again, uh, follow our Instagram account, academics underscore 95, that's A-C-A-D-E-M-I-X underscore 95, and we also have a Twitter account. Uh, you can follow us at Professor Wren on Twitter. Uh, and that's really all I have for you today. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see y'alls next time.